In this series, we're going to bridge the gap between photophysics and photochemistry and focus in on an important process for excited states, energy transfer. The transfer of that excitation energy to another molecule. So we're moving from unimolecular processes. So far, we've only thought about things happening inside of the excited state molecule, like intersystem crossing and internal conversion, to bimolecular processes where another molecule, typically in its ground state, becomes involved. And energy transfer has very important practical applications. And I'll give you two examples here. The first is to access excited states that are difficult or impossible to access using direct excitation. The classic example being the first excited triplet states, the T1 states of alkenes and aromatics. These are so far separated from the first excited singlet states in energy that intersystem crossing is very slow. And so they're very difficult to access by direct excitation followed by ISC. And of course, exciting from the S0 state up to T1 is going to have a very, very low probability of happening because that's a radiative transition with a flip and a spin, essentially the reverse of phosphorescence. So to access those triplet states, if we want to access them to study them or take advantage of a reaction that they do, we use the energy of a higher energy triplet state of a different molecule, transfer that energy to the alkene or aromatic to generate its T1 state, and the T1 state then does what we want it to do from there. That process of transferring energy from a higher energy triplet state to form a lower energy triplet state of a different molecule is called sensitization, and it's an important entry into a variety of photochemical reactions. The second place where photo-induced energy transfer is really important is in photosynthesis. This is essentially how the energy of the sun is transduced into the energy used to power chemical reactions, carbohydrate synthesis, etc. There's an energy transfer step from an electronically excited state that ultimately powers the chemical synthesis of carbohydrates. And understanding that energy transfer step has been critical for really unpacking the mechanism of photosynthesis and designing artificial photosynthetic systems that, again, do what photosynthesis does and power chemical synthesis using the energy of light. So in this video series, we're going to survey the different types of energy transfer, talk about their differences, some of their important differences mechanistically, and also how they depend on, for example, the distance between the two molecules engaging in energy transfer, and we'll dig into sensitization and see how it's used to power a number of photochemical reactions that cannot be done any other way. Let's start with an overview of energy transfer, talking about some broad applications as well as some very general points when it comes to energy transfer from an electronically excited state. So first, let's talk about applications. And just to orient ourselves, very generally, what we can think of energy transfer as in, a, in almost a chemical equation kind of sense is we have an excited state, D star, and the D refers to the energy donor. And we have an acceptor molecule, A, that's in its ground state. The energy transfer process involves the transfer or the shift of the excitation energy from D to A. So on the product side, we have A in an electronically excited state and D in its ground state. And this simple process has a variety of important applications. Energy harvesting is one. Photosynthesis and photovoltaic cells, solar cells. Both of these take advantage of the transfer of energy from an excited state to a different energetic mode where we generate a current in the case of a photovoltaic cell or do chemical synthesis in the case of photosynthesis. Energy transfer also opens the door to unique reactivity of structures that are very difficult to access through other means. So for example, we mentioned the triplet states of alkenes being very difficult to access through electronic excitation. On the other hand, these can easily be generated using sensitization from a molecule that forms a higher energy triplet state. And this opens the door to unique chemical reactions, unique photochemical reactions. A third application, which will come into focus as we pro progress through this lesson, is for measuring distances. Energy transfer has a profound distance dependence, and in particular, one of the mechanisms of energy transfer we'll discuss can be felt over very large distances and is highly sensitive to changes in distance. And so this can be used to measure the distances between two chromophores inside a system. And this is commonly applied in biochemistry, for example, to look at distances inside proteins. In this example, we see that a protein is undergoing a conformational change. 
And we can see that conformational change in a change in the extent of energy transfer between these two chromophores, E945 and D435. Most broadly, what can we say about energy transfer? Well, involving energy, photochemical energy transfer is subject to the laws of thermodynamics. And so energy transfer must be thermodynamically favorable. Overall, this is not to say that energy transfer cannot be endothermic, but if it is, we need to consider where is the energy coming from, and if for exothermic energy transfer, where is the excess energy going? And another aspect of this is that energy transfer must be consistent with our selection rules, particularly our, our zero order selection rules. And again, as we saw for transitions, photophysical transitions, rules are made to be broken and weak interactions, weak mechanisms can sometimes cause energy transfer to happen even when the selection rules suggest that it will not. But we have to understand the interaction or the mechanism that enables that process, a first order correction to our zero order selection rule. So we've already noted that we're defining D star as the energy donor, the excited state of the donor. A is the energy acceptor in its ground state. And the thermodynamic criterion here is that the free energy of D plus A star must be lower than the free energy of D star plus A, or we must have some available energy if we're talking about an endothermic or endergonic energy transfer process in order to make this work. So I don't want to mislead you into believing that endothermic energy transfer is impossible. That said, what we will see is that endothermic energy transfer in a photochemical context is very often kinetically very slow and very difficult to take advantage of. Now, spin, we've seen selection rules for already, and the selection rules related to spin must be followed. No change in spin multiplicity unless coupling to some other change in angular momentum is possible. So spin orbit coupling, if that can come into play, if a magnetic field is involved, then a change in spin multiplicity may be possible. Generally speaking, though, it's much more common to allow inner system crossing to take care of changes in spin for us and do singlet-singlet or triplet-triplet energy transfer. In thinking about how to classify the different types of energy transfer, we can make two important distinctions. The first is between radiative and non-radiative energy transfer. Radiative energy transfer, as we'll call it later, trivial energy transfer, is actually relatively, I mean, pardon the pun, but trivial, <laughs> in that all it involves, all, quote unquote, it involves, is the emission of a photon from the excited state and the absorption of a photon by the energy acceptor. So in that sense, it's no different than emission, say fluorescence by the energy donor, and absorption, singlet, singlet absorption by the energy acceptor. It has a few other quirks about it, and we'll get to those when we talk about trivial energy transfer, but by and large, it's not that interesting theoretically. Non-radiative energy transfer is much more interesting, and non-radiative mechanisms can be divided into two types, the so-called exchange or dexter energy transfer mechanism, and the so-called coulombic or forster or dipolar mechanism. These, all three of these terms mean the same thing. So we can kind of create a, a diagram here, a flowchart, if you will, of the different types of energy transfer. We have radiative versus non-radiative. The trivial mechanism is the only radiative mechanism of any energy transfer that we will discuss. And non-radiative transfer can be broken up into electron exchange. The term exchange, by the way, refers to electron exchange for reasons that will become clear later. Or the Coulombic or Forster mechanism. And which mechanism occurs has a profound impact on the kinetics, the distance dependence, and how we think about energy transfer taking place. And so the distinctions here are very important.